We welcome, we welcome today Emmanuel Barillo, which is uh, director of uh, uh, bioinformatics department at Institut Curie and head of computational systems biology of cancer um, lab. So I'm a bit biased towards Emmanuel because I was working under him for, for several years. So the, I, yeah, I contributed in some of his works, but mainly he has been working in bioinformatics and systems biology for, for many, many years and uh, mainly contributing on, on, on the part of, of maps or networks and also in, in, in models, Boolean models and, and other kinds of models. So, yeah, he has made many contributions uh, to, um, to the field and I think, I, uh, I think we could say that, that he's one of the leading bioinformaticians in, in France and in, in Europe in general. So, as I say, I'm quite biased. So anyway, uh, let's uh, welcome, welcome Emmanuel and, and please, um, uh, very nice to have you, to have you here. And we'll take questions, I guess, at the end of, of the talk. So, Manuel, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Arnaud, for this introduction. It's, it's quite nice to be introduced by you, I must say. <laughs> uh, so, I'm from a city Curie, as uh, Arnaud said, but uh, also from uh, the National Institute of Health uh, in CERN. Uh, and uh, maybe before Getting into the scientific part, I just want to say two words about the Institut Curie. We are a comprehensive cancer center in, a, in the middle of Paris. We do uh, the continuum of research from fundamental research to translational and clinical research. And we, uh, we treat uh, patients, I mean, each time possible with innovative treatments. There are three hospitals and three uh, research centers at, at Curie, all of them in Paris or uh, very close to Paris. We are also devoted to uh, teaching and training that's one uh, big axis of our activity. Many core facilities, which for computational biologists is quite, uh, I mean, uh, convenient. Uh, it includes all uh, flavor of, of NGS, I mean, mass spec, uh, husbandry, uh, single cell, uh, spatial transcriptomics, uh, and uh, I mean, antibodies and many others. And we do have a, a small high performance computing by, uh, I mean, small by uh, your standards, of course, in uh, at BSC. Uh, it's like six uh, petabytes of storage on uh, 6,000 cores. So nothing comparable with what you are lucky to have. Um, I'm also part of a, a new institute, which I want to advertise a bit. It's a new institute for artificial intelligence, uh, which was created two years ago, uh, and which, I mean, uh, trying to gather people involved uh, either in, a, in core mathematical foundation of artificial intelligence, or in uh, the interdisciplinary research using uh, artificial intelligence to, uh, to solve uh, concrete questions, and in particular in life sciences, which is uh, the reason uh, I'm part of it. And there is a strong training component. The idea of the Institute is mainly to uh, increase the number of uh, people trained in uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in the field, because we, uh, we struggle to recruit uh, good uh, skilled uh, machine learning persons. And it, uh, it's also a collaboration between uh, academic partners. Uh, we are here as part of PSL and uh, industrial members, including on the life size Pfizer, Janssen, G Healthcare, and a few uh, well-known uh, others from, from the GAFA. As I, as I said before, we, uh, we recruit uh, postdocs, in, in particular in the context in of this uh, institute. So contact me if you are interested in uh, in that. So uh, we, we work on computational system biology of cancer in, uh, in Curie, being in a cancer institute. And uh, well, just made to position ourselves in the field, uh, there are two main approaches to, uh, to the question. One is to, to consider the, the system of uh, the patient or the tumor uh, like a black box where uh, perturbations are applied or, uh, or measured, like uh, mutation, for example, or, or drug. And uh, you measure outputs, uh, typically that's the uh, high throughput profiles, and you do some statistical analysis. It's the field of machine learning, and uh, it's data driven. And uh, sometimes the risk is that it ends up in a phenomenological uh, uh, description of, of uh, facts, um, but it's also quite successful. Another approach is to pretend that uh, we know enough about the internals of the system uh, to be able to use this information to do some mechanistic modeling of what's uh, going on in a, in a tumor, for example. And uh, by internals, we can, for example, mean all the knowledge we have now of the circuitry of, 
regulations uh, networks of, of the cell of, and of intercellular communications. So this is an approach which is all often model driven and can lead to abstraction, which recapitulates the observation, but uh, is so fall short in uh, making new prediction. Uh, so what we do in uh, our uh, team is to try to uh, take the best of these two approaches uh, to better understand the psychology of cancer and provide an impact on uh, uh, the therapeutic research. And to do so, we have three, uh, three main pillars in our group, uh, all based on uh, some knowledge of cancer biology. We're not pure uh, mathematicians. One is to develop uh, knowledge maps of, of cancer by, uh, I mean, mining the literature. One is to model uh, networks uh, involved in uh, the control of uh, tumor uh, births and growth. And uh, another one is to do uh, high dimensional statistical uh, analysis of multi, uh, multi omics data and to try to join all of this together. And for doing so, we also develop uh, statistical methodologies and, and software. And I will give you a, a few examples of uh, what we did of these three parts I have circled here. So I won't talk about the knowledge maps, but I just want to mention that we, uh, we have developed uh, an atlas of cancer signaling networks, which uh, collect many, many uh, biochemical reactions we have been extracting from the literature. So it's uh, curated. Uh, well-established uh, signaling uh, network is not high throughput data. And we are part for this activity on the others of the system uh, medicine disease maps community, uh, for which we also developed uh, a disease map uh, recapitulating all the molecular mechanisms uh, known to, do, to play a role in, uh, in, uh, in COVID-19. In particular, I mean, of the, the virus-human uh, interaction. Okay, and we have a group of, uh, as of today, 20, about 20 persons. Uh, and this is the uh, last picture we have. It dates back before the lockdown. And uh, it was during one of our retreat. And you can uh, recognize a well-known face, I guess, in, uh, at BSC. I don't know which, I mean, we, we missed a lot. And we're in the very heart of, uh, of Paris, so uh, uh, quite... Uh, nice location if you are interested in joining the group. Okay, so uh, now to the three points of my talk. Uh, the first one was uh, about a story about uh, medulloblastoma biology and uh, how to use multiomics to uh, get insight into it. Second one about uh, an algorithmic aspect of uh, deciphering trajectories in two very different types of, uh, of data, single cell and clinical records. And last one would be uh, something we uh, we do in collaboration with some people at BSC, uh, including uh, space and molecular networks in the modeling of, uh, of cancer. So, medulloblastoma first. So, as you as you might might know, I mean, medulloblastoma is a pediatric is a pediatric cancer, and these pediatric cancers they suffer from the fact they're orphan diseases. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, the first one is a nice one in the sense that it's, they have low incidence. It means the market is small and uh, pharma are not that much interested. Uh, the second reason is that uh, we lack funding for early stage research. It has improved over the last years, but uh, it's still something which is quite marked. And the third one is more scientific. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, the frequency of mutation of different cancers here on, uh, on this figure, you can see that the uh, medulloblastoma, for example, at other pediatric diseases are quite uh, not that much mutated, I mean, logically enough, since they occur early in life, and which means that there are reduced molecular target options if you want to go for target therapy. And uh, if not, well, this is likely to uh, toxic side effects, which are quite uh, detrimental in the context of uh, developing uh, uh, organism. And uh, on a, as a result of that, I mean, the cost of conducting uh, trials in uh, pediatry is quite, uh, quite high. And uh, the cost of treatment is anticipated to be uh, to be very very large, but uh, but in Curie we uh, we do have a, a full department of pediatry with a, a lot of research on many uh, pediatric diseases, including uh, medulloblastoma, but also others like neuroblastoma or uh, Ewing sarcoma and uh, retinoblastoma and a few and a few others. So medulloblastoma is the most common uh, malignant uh, solid brain tumor uh, of childhood. It's uh, a few tens per cases per year in France, meaning a few uh, 
probably thousands worldwide, so it's still uh, significant. And it's located into uh, the cerebellum and affects mainly uh, young uh, children. The bad thing about it is that one third of patients are incurable and uh, they suffer uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, from, from the treatments and those that survive have, uh, for example, impairment in the behavior or cognition uh, and they're very prone to develop a second cancer. So the picture is quite, uh, is quite bad. It has been classified in, uh, in, uh, in four groups for, for 10 years now. Uh, and uh, one of the original thing is that, uh, to my knowledge, it's the only uh, tumor which uses two uh, omics uh, profiles, meaning which is multi-omics in the clinic. Uh, in the clinic, uh, I mean, to determine the, the groups to which a patient belongs, uh, it's based on a, a, a transcriptome, but also a DNA uh, methylome. And four groups are uh, distinguished. I mean, uh, wind uh, group, which is dominated by uh, uh, which is, I mean, um, where wind uh, pathway is uh, dysregulated, and uh, the second group is SHH, and then there is two groups for which there is no clear uh, drivers, which are called group three uh, and group four. So in group three, often uh, MIC is uh, overexpressed. Uh, if you look at how, uh, with a simple, I mean, PCA on uh, these uh, figures appear, you see that wind of SHH are quite, quite well separated, but group three and four, uh, there is a gray, a gray area in between uh, all of them. And that's a bit uh, unfortunate because if you look now at the clinical picture of these uh, four groups, you can see that uh, uh, group uh, three and four have markedly different uh, outcomes. Four on wind are quite, uh, I mean, good prognosis groups, whereas uh, group three and uh, uh, SHH are uh, much more uh, deadly. So we, we went with uh, Olivier Eros Lab, who's uh, the main investigator behind this, uh, this study, to a comprehensive uh, multi mix uh, analysis of uh, a set of tumors, which is quite low. Uh, I mean, only uh, 39 samples because, I mean, it's a rare tumor. And because if you want to go into full characterization, well, it makes things, of course, more costly and more and longer to achieve. But we went for a genome, a methylome, transcriptome, as usual, but also proteome and a phosphoproteome. And with the idea that uh, we wanted uh, to understand the biology of spirulosoma better and to find out uh, what was the set of origin, which was still unknown, and to develop models for the lab, which uh, we are missing in particular for group four, not for all groups, but for group four. And of course, then the idea is to identify uh, biomarkers uh, for our diagnostic, pronostic, uh, and, uh, and to possibly launch uh, clinical trials uh, with new uh, therapeutic strategies. So uh, how do the group uh, show up? Uh, when you use the different types of omics data. If you use them independently as shown here, on the top you have the group classification as determined by the, by the clinician on the bona fide method. And then uh, for each omics you have, I mean, the classification obtained. So not surprisingly, uh, you retrieve, I mean, the difficult distinction between group three and four for, for uh, transcriptome and methylome. And proteomics recapitulate quite well the, 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 the four and distinguish well the, the four groups, whereas phosphoproteomics give a more blurry uh, picture. And the question is how to integrate these different types of data. And when you are faced with this uh, question, you have uh, basically uh, three possible strategies. One is to go for an early integration, meaning uh, concatenating all your matrices and uh, using uh, well, all I mean, methods we can have in, uh, in machine learning to analyze these as a new matrix. Uh, well, the problem, it comes with problem, which is that the dimension becomes even higher. And uh, also, uh, I mean, there might be some imbalance in uh, from one omics to, uh, to the other, so for example, uh, methylation versus uh, uh, genome level, and, uh, and then it gives an advantage to one omics versus the other, which is not good. Another approach is to use the late integration, meaning analyzing each omics at a turn and then combining the results and which genes, for example, show up. And if there is an intersection, you're, you're, you're lucky. But when doing so, you do not take into account, I mean, the, the fact that uh, one layer can uh, influence another um, and inform on another. And the other one is to use intermediate data integration. That's, of course, uh, the best one if possible. And the idea is that if you have the different description of your data with 
uh, each omics, then uh, you hypothesize that there exists some latent uh, space representation of all this data, uh, which you can infer from this different level of omics. And if you infer it, then you can work on this new space uh, to, uh, to analyze your data. So it can be done using uh, matrix factorization. I mean, joint matrix factorization. It can be done using uh, uh, auto encoders. Uh, but there, we the method is a bit different. We use uh, what is uh, known to be called uh, similarity network fusion, where uh, for each uh, genomic omics feature, you derive one uh, neighborhood uh, graph in between your two morphs. And then you let that graph evolve and converge by iterative, I mean, update of each uh, graph level using the information of the of the other graph. And you reach a quantitative network that you can then uh, use, uh, for example, uh, with spectral clustering to define your, your groups. So what does it give when you do that on the blastoma? Well, if you look at these four different omics uh, for which uh, we have uh, profiled our tumors, if you use each of them separately, you retrieve the picture I mentioned before with the difficult separation between groups three and four and proteomics uh, performing nicely to uh, identify, I mean, at least better to identify group four, and for some proteomics being a bit, uh, a bit blurry. But then if you uh, do this multi-omics approach, uh, quite um, magically, you uh, distinguish very well the four different uh, subgroups. So that's very important for uh, in medical doctors to be able to uh, differentiate this uh, group three and group four. And it seems to be uh, something to, uh, to favor in the profiling of patients in the future. Then we went for quantification of, uh, of the pathway in each, uh, each of the groups. Here, I just want to mention the method we, uh, we used, uh, which we developed a few years ago and continuously uh, used and improved for them. It's something which is based on PCA. Uh, just look at the picture at the bottom. And the idea is that uh, we want to identify which pathway is active in, uh, in different, uh, in one given subgroup, for example. And we want to do that not in a differential approach. I mean, we have four different subgroups. Of course, there are some differential approach to uh, figure out which pathway is more expressed in one situation than another. But there, the question is different. We just want to make, uh, to, to know which pathway is active in a given subgroup. And for that, it's based on uh, A, the dispersion of the gene sets uh, of the pathway with respect to all of the other gene as depicted on, uh, on this uh, picture on the, on the left, uh, or the coordination of, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, genes on so the same pathway, uh, the co coordination behavior with respect to the rest of the genes. And of course, it's, it's done using a reference uh, databases. So by doing so, we're able to uh, to quantify the activity of pathway for each of the four different groups. And we uh, did it uh, with the transcriptome on the left and the proteome on the, on the right. So we retrieve, I mean, the wind pathway activated. We have the name of the pathway on the, on the right here. We retrieve the wind pathway activated in wind, both at transcriptome and proteome level. Same for SHH pathway for uh, the group SHH and uh, the MIC pathway for group three. And for group four, what's interesting is that at proteomic level, you can clearly see that the RTK signaling is uh, overexpressed, which is not the case at all in, uh, it's not visible at all at, uh, at the transcriptome level. And of course, there are other pathways activated in different uh, subgroups. So then we went to the phosphoproteome activity and did the same analysis. And again, we could find that uh, RTK pathways are uh, upregulated in, in group four and quite specifically, I must say. So with that in mind, we did uh, a confirmation a, 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 on the phosphorylation specific to group four on independent set of, uh, of tumors and analyzing uh, the pathways downstream of, uh, I mean, uh, RTK signaling, in particular downstream to RBB and uh, GPCR, we could find that the most uh, deregulated genes were ERBB4, which is specifically expressed in uh, group four, which was, I mean, checked uh, with an independent set of, uh, of tumors, and uh, on SARC, uh, which played a key role uh, in, uh, in the crosstalk between PS3 kinase and MAP kinase pathways. So once this was validated, we, uh, our partners went for uh, uh, mapping the expression of uh, these two genes uh, in, uh, in a mouse embryo and found out that uh, this expression is uh, specific to the nuclear transition zone, which appeared to be uh, a very good candidate for the cell of origin of group 4 medulloblastoma. 
then they engineered a, a mice, uh, some mice, uh, some mice, some mice in fact, uh, with SARC uh, uh, expressed and uh, dominant uh, negative PPT3 uh, uh, gene. And this uh, may mouse show that uh, indeed they develop quite rapidly uh, uh, tumors, and meaning that uh, by doing so, we uh, we have a model of group for medulloblastoma. Uh, and the other point is that the transcriptome of uh, this engineer mice, if you compare it to the transcriptome of group four and group three uh, tumors, it falls quite, uh, I mean, reasonably uh, well close to uh, to this uh, to this transcriptome. So the model is, I mean, seems to be uh, satisfactory. At least it's the best that we have today. So to conclude on, on this part, uh, say that with multiomics we were able. Uh, to better delineate the different subgroups and to have a new uh, classification strategy, and uh, to identify, thanks to proteomics and proteomics, uh, specific uh, biomarkers of, of group four, we say BB4 on SARC, and design uh, a mouse model which was lacking up to now for, uh, for group four. And now, with their perspective of new therapy, because they are inhibitors which are effective against uh, BB4, and it's something which is uh, now under uh, construction. So just let me remind you that the main PI is Oliviero, and the main actors were on the medical side, uh, like a hospital in Paris and Sick Kid Hospital in Canada, and Essen and Heidelberg in, uh, in Germany. Okay, uh, so now I will move to uh, the second uh, uh, story, which is about disappearing trajectories using uh, single cell data and clinical records. And the idea is that now with uh, microfluidics, and barcoding uh, on NGS, we are uh, able to uh, separate uh, cells one by one to mark them by with uh, with barcodes and to uh, to sequence uh, after permeabilization uh, many uh, aspects of their uh, omics. Uh, the most known being, uh, of course, transcriptome, but there are many uh, many others. Uh, and there are even now, I mean, uh, a phase where you can profile simultaneously uh, transcriptome on the some epigenome aspect, for example. So this gives uh, access to uh, the distribution and not only the average values, which is completely uh, much richer, of course, and it enables to, uh, in particular, in the, to study uh, cancer uh, to, to, to the effect heterogeneity, but also to uh, have an idea of the dynamics of, uh, of the cells in, uh, during the pathology. Uh, one key point with this uh, new technology is that uh, we have very, I mean, uh, high uh, dimensional data sets, because before uh, a typical study on cancer would be a few hundreds or thousands of tumors and a few, uh, like 10 to the four genes. And now we, we have gained uh, at least two, if not three, uh, order of magnitude in the data set we, we, uh, we have at our disposal. So this means that we need to have computationally very efficient algorithms. And also, I mean, the question that we have right now is a bit uh, different from a mathematical point of view from, than, uh, than the one Many approaches have been uh, taken before, and in particular because we uh, expect to find out uh, bifurcation processes, meaning uh, nonlinear uh, behaviors. So the algorithm must be adapted to this question. The other point, you know, it is uh, the problem of uh, uh, this data is much more noisy and sparse than uh, the bulk data. If you see one cell by cell on uh, on the right, I mean, two different. Uh, genes uh, which are completely correlated because they're the same phase of the cell cycle. You can see that when you do bulk sequencing on the left, they are quite well correlated. Whereas if you do cell by cell, uh, I mean, the coefficient of correlation drops much lower. And it's because, I mean, when you extract the mRNA from, from the single cells, you might miss some of them. Amplification might not amplify them. And uh, you have many zeros, which are not actual zeros. So you need uh, algorithms which are robust to noise and sparsity. So there are two main questions which have been uh, approached using single cell. It's clustering, finding cell types, and finding trajectories, meaning uh, on the times along this trajectory. I mean, uh, how far you are on the trajectory. Uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, I will be talking uh, only on the second part. So there are many algorithms which are available now uh, for solving uh, these problems and uh, our world is, uh, is here. Just to mention, I mean, uh, a few tricks in, uh, in, uh, in this field. Uh, many methods for uh, uh, single cell transcriptome analysis, uh, they use uh, CANIRES uh, 
neighbor graph. And uh, we know that it behaves quite, uh, I mean, unsatisfactorily in high dimension, and in particular also in the presence of noise. Here we have one example where you built the KNN graph for different value of K in a not noisy environment, so it works well, I mean, whatever the K. But in a noisy one, very rapidly the graph you obtain is uh, meaningless. So this means that uh, that's the reason why, um, I mean, many approaches that just reduce the uh, dimension uh, before uh, the further analysis, which means that you lose a lot of, uh, you lose a lot of information in the early stage of, uh, of the algorithm. So the algorithm that we propose is based on a manifold techniques, which is known as principal uh, elastic graphs. And it allows for detecting branches, uh, pseudotimes, and also oscillating behaviors. As you can see on this picture, uh, it can uh, find not only trees, but also graphs. In fact, any, uh, any uh, uh, topology uh, can, be, can be found by this algorithm. So how does it work? Well, if your data is looking like, uh, like that with uh, uh, these data points, I mean, what you want to do is certainly not uh, this, but rather something like that, meaning that you want to find out uh, points, to learn points, which recapitulate well uh, the, the curve that you distinguish by, uh, by high. And mathematically, this means that uh, you want that uh, these points that you have to find are in the middle of data points. Uh, you want that the edges that you want to find are not too much, uh, do not have too uh, steep curves, uh, quite rather linear. And that when you have a branching, uh, well, the center of the branch should be more or less in the middle of its neighbors. And what is nice to in this formulation, which I mean, is that uh, it's quadratic. Uh, so what you want to do is in fact to minimize a function, which is very easy to minimize uh, and very rapid to minimize uh, computationally, contrary to many other approaches which use this much more complex uh, algorithmics. Of course, when you do that, uh, you minimize uh, for a given architecture, but you have to find the good architecture of your, uh, of, your, uh, of your graph, I mean, the good topology. And for doing so, we just start from a simple topology, and then we do gradient descent in uh, the space of all possible topologies by adding a node or adding a branch, and then figuring out if the neighboring branches achieve better optimization or not. And by doing so, little by little, you converge to uh, some optimal solution. So uh, the features of the algorithm is that it's very fast. It can process millions of cells in a very short time, and it's robust to, uh, to very high uh, level of noise. And this uh, figure, you can see that if there is uh, almost no noise, you can find nicely the the topology of, uh, of the tree. And here there are many, many, many uh, noisy data points, like here 90% of, of noise. It can still retrieve something which is uh, meaningful, so you can hardly distinguish the original uh, data points. It's also robust to, uh, to done sampling and also to over sampling, which is important because when you gather this uh, uh, single cell transcriptome, I mean, some part of it will be over sampled, some part will be sampled. It's important to be robust to, to this. Compared to others, it can learn very different topologies. It can learn emergent topologies for which we have no idea what they look like. And it can uh, approximate uh, a complex data structure. So it's, uh, it's a package which is available under GitHub, but it's also implemented into uh, some, uh, some tools, in particular in uh, the stream tools that uh, Pinedo Lab in, uh, in Boston, uh, which where it comes with a lot of tools for uh, visualization on uh, differential characterization of genes. Uh, genes uh, accompanying uh, a bifurcation, for example, or, uh, or a transition uh, uh, along, along a branch. So we, uh, with, uh, with this tool, we have, uh, I mean, a robust and efficient algorithm, uh, which is implemented. And now uh, we are moving to the implementation of multimodal analysis uh, of uh, of uh, uh, transcriptome plus epigenome. So this was uh, developed uh, under the supervision of uh, Andrei Zavyev, with mainly with Luke Bergant. I know there is a new team integrating these three other persons to uh, continue the development. 
And we also apply this tool to a completely uh, different uh, question. And uh, this is how to analyze uh, a large clinical data set. You know that in hospitals, uh, there is a lot of information in the patient uh, electronic health records of many types, uh, and it is underexploited. Uh, and uh, one, one idea is that uh, we should be able to uh, uh, implement the analysis of what we call a dynamic uh, phenotype and with the idea that uh, if you are able to figure out uh, where the patient is in the context of a devolution, uh, you'll be better, uh, I mean, uh, informed to take a medical decision than if you only have a static picture of uh, of his state. We went uh, to to study this question using uh, as, as a model uh, myocardial infraction heart attack which is quite important uh, uh, public health issue, uh, of course, in, uh, in many countries and uh, comes with the usual uh, risk factors. I mean, don't smoke, don't eat alcohol, don't eat jack food and do sport. Uh, and uh, one, one key point in this uh, disease is that when a patient comes to the hospital with symptoms, it might either end up with no complication at all or, or be death. And it's not that easy for the medical doctors to distinguish between these two extremes. Uh, and, and since time is critical in, uh, in the care of these patients, it's important to, uh, to have an idea of how to distinguish between them. So we use a data set from uh, Kraft Neuharsk hospitals back uh, 25 years ago with 1,700 patients and with many different features uh, describing uh, the patient. I mean, approximately all what the patients has to, to undergo in terms of uh, question from the medical doctors, former habits, uh, diet, uh, and uh, med some medical, some previous medical records. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, features describing the complication and the causes uh, of this. So it's uh, 1,700 static pictures, but the hypothesis we made is that taken all together, they might recapitulate uh, the trajectory space in which a myocardial infarction patient uh, is, uh, is traveling through, through during his disease. Uh, and, uh, and then this information can be used for any uh, single patient. So what we did then is uh, simply to apply uh, the LP graph I mentioned before. I say simply, but in fact, it's quite uh, a bit more delicate than with a, a single cell transcriptome or, or, or other mixed data. And maybe because you have very different types of, uh, of data in the hospital, uh, you have binary variable, you have a, a categorical variable, you have continuous variable, uh, and, and so on. So uh, there is a, I mean, a quite uh, elaborated uh, cuisine to make all these variables comparable and usable. And, and then you are using that, we are able to reconstruct this, uh, this tree, this principal uh, a tree of the possible evolution of, uh, of patients who uh, through, through their disease. And the root node was positioned where there is a, the, the, the optimal situation with absolutely no, no, no complication. And as you can see, I mean, these trees, they lead, uh, the tree, they lead quite uh, convincingly uh, toward one phenotype or, or another. It's also a way then to visualize uh, different types of uh, variable and also to uh, define uh, clusters. I mean, each branch here can be inter interpreted as a cluster, and this type of clustering, which is based on branches and not geometrical uh, proximity, makes probably more, more sense in a, in a clinical uh, uh, perspective. The other thing which uh, you can do using uh, this type of tree is to figure out uh, what are the variables which are, I mean, correlated with one particular path into this uh, uh, set of trajectories and to regress them to find out uh, whether they are predictive of the evolution of the, of the patient. That's quite, uh, uh, that can be quite useful for, uh, for medical use afterwards. So all of this is implemented in, uh, in the package, which we call clean uh, Trajan for trajectory uh, analysis, uh, and uh, it's available on, uh, on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, the perspective that we have now is to uh, extend this work, uh, A, using partially di diachronic data, because in the context of cancer, people that come there and they visit, uh, 
uh, hospitals quite uh, on a regular basis, at least for some time. So if we, we can have real diachronic data or not uh, fellow diachronic reconstructed transatlantic pictures, and also to add uh, real life data. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, now a, a health data hub, which is collecting in France all medical data, uh, which uh, social security is reimbursing. So that's quite a nice source of information uh, for uh, pushing this type of projects. The main problem we have with this type of project is to have access of, to the data. Uh, and that's the reason why we use uh, this myocardial infraction uh, data, uh, which we are not specialists at all of, and not cancer data, because as of today, despite the fact that most patients would agree to share the data for the benefit of uh, future patient and for the help of uh, scientists, uh, it's still very difficult to have access to, uh, to clinical data uh, and to conduct this type of uh, analysis with, uh, with real uh, actual clinical data. So my last point will be about the modeling of uh, molecular networks on space. And I will give you a very uh, simple, small example on uh, breast cancer. So first, I want to underline that uh, space uh, is key to understand uh, cancer for, for many reasons. I mean, uh, and if I take them uh, in no particular order, I mean, one is heterogeneity of the tumor. We you know it's heterogeneous with clones and cyclones. One is the microenvironment of the tumor hole, of the tumor itself, uh, with many different types of infiltrates, for example, uh, with signaling molecules floating around, uh, with vascularization of the tumor, which plays a key role as well. Another key aspect, a special aspect in tumors, are the physical barriers, whether it's uh, the epithelium or the extracellular matrix, including uh, the basal membrane around the organ. Uh, that's key in uh, understanding the biology, but all the more in understanding the clinics uh, of, uh, of the tumor. And another one is, of course, the physical uh, interaction, adhesion, uh, polarity of cells, uh, which are key in uh, many uh, carcinomas and so on. Somehow, I mean, cancer is not only a molecular disease, but also a, a cell on a tissue disease. Okay, uh, and all these aspects are also governed by uh, signaling networks, which we also need to, uh, to model if you want to under, understand cancer. So to conclude, I mean, multi-omics and multi-scale spatial modeling is needed uh, for future progress in, uh, in, uh, in the context of cancer. So, so now we have this method of spatial transcriptomics, which enables to uh, determine the transcriptome of, uh, say, a tumor uh, with spatial information. I mean, uh, cells are you know, on, on the slides are permeabilized and put in contact with another slide with uh, uh, barcodes, which are specific to uh, physical position. And then uh, when you sequence your transcriptome, you see also sequence the barcode, which indicates the physical origin of the, of the cell. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's quite nice. Uh, but uh, the fact is that how is it used today, this type of information? And if you look at the papers on special transcriptomics, I mean, many of them, they just consider the distance uh, between uh, cells from different types. And uh, typically, for example, uh, uh, CD8 plus uh, effect effector T cells and tumor cells, are they close together uh, or not? Of course, it's a very relevant and important information, but uh, they make little use of uh, uh, the special information which is embedded in the, in the transcriptome they have, uh, have measured. The other point is that to understand cancer, we also need to go 3G and not to stay at the 2G level. So the architecture of the system has to be, uh, has to be modeled. And there I want just to say a word about uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, well, as you know, I mean, there are several uh, uh, support in artificial intelligence. One is about machine learning, which has been heavily used in the context of computational genomics. Uh, in particular, uh, SVM and random forest are still the most used uh, uh, techniques. But of course, I mean, uh, neural networks are getting a lot of momentum. But there is also another approach to uh, uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, not based on learning from, uh, from data. But one example of, of them is uh, agent-based modeling. Uh, the idea is that uh, your system is modeled with uh, many agents, each agent has its own behavior and it can sense the environment, it can talk and receive messages from other agents. And by doing so, uh, with simple behavior for, uh, for each agent, uh, complex phenomena can emerge in, uh, in the system. 
And what we uh, wanted to do is to simulate uh, the system of the tumor, like a set of multiple agents in interaction, each of them being a general cell, which can proliferate or die, grow or shrink, move, and interact with, uh, with other adhesion or sending messages. One of the nice things uh, about this approach, besides the fact that it's uh, uh, it's recapitulated space. It's also that it's uh, an efficient framework for uh, integration of, uh, of prior knowledge. So for doing so, we uh, uh, collaborated with uh, several partners. One of them is uh, Paul McLean and Ronnie Island from the uh, University of Indiana, uh, who have developed uh, PhysiCell, which is a biophysical simulation software, which enables to simulate uh, this uh, agent-based modeling of uh, of a cellular system. The idea is that each cell in their model has size, position, and phenotypes. Uh, and that's mainly uh, about physical aspect, meaning uh, it can migrate, it can interact, it can grow and divide. Uh, it's not that much about biochemical uh, things. Of course, in, in space, you have cells, but you also have many molecules which are very important. It can be a growth factor, it can be nutrients, and so on. And these ones in their setting is represented uh, as a gradient, which is then uh, uh, used uh, to solve diffusion equation and uh, uh, to update the system uh, time step per, uh, per time step. As a very simple uh, uh, example uh, with, uh, with cells for which uh, there are two populations, blue and red, with different level of adhesion in between them. Uh, their system is able to recapitulate uh, what is observed experimentally, meaning that the less adhesive cells will be pushed at the periphery and the most adhesive will be kept at, uh, at the center. So for the modeling of tumor, we, uh, we start with uh, modeling the tumor as a steroid system and uh, surrounded by uh, some uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, the extracellular matrix is quite important, as uh, I said before, because it's uh, a barrier for the cell, but it's also uh, uh, where uh, many uh, of uh, the aspect of cell adhesion, cell division, and so on, are regulated, in particular, uh, with the presence of uh, other molecules, uh, but also it, uh, it provides substrate uh, and this substrate, if the cell wants to migrate, for example, has to be uh, uh, degraded, which is achieved uh, using uh, some specific uh, signaling, in particular, uh, metalloproteinase. Here you can see how, for example, cells uh, which secrete uh, MMPs will progressively uh, degrade ECM and find their way across the membrane. So, but then we also wanted to, uh, to model the internals uh, of the cell, in particular, all the molecular uh, networks which takes place and regulates the different aspects which are represented at the physical level, a growth, uh, a differentiation, uh, uh, death, and, and so on. So for doing so, we, uh, we designed a, a Boolean network model of uh, the main uh, proteins, complexes, and phenomena that uh, govern cell growth, death, adhesion, and migration. Altogether, it's 50, uh, 50 nodes. And we use uh, a simulator, a stochastic simulator that uh, we developed uh, in the group of you uh, for, for, for the last 10 years, uh, actually. But by doing so, what we are able to do uh, is uh, to uh, marry together the, phys the physical level and uh, the biochemical level, physicel plus my boss, that's a uh, tool we call uh, physibus. And uh, each cell, each agent has a set of biophysical behaviors. And these biophysical behaviors, they might trigger some internal uh, molecular behavior of, uh, of the cell. Typically, uh, ECM sensing will trigger uh, the production of integrins and so on. This will modify the status of the internal uh, molecular networks of the cell, which in turn, with result in uh, modified outputs from uh, this uh, molecular network of the cell, which have an impact on uh, the phenotypic, the physical phenotypic level of, uh, of the system. Maybe death, it might be uh, cycling or, or others. And then we, uh, we applied this, uh, this approach to uh, a small uh, pilot project, which is a breast cancer uh, invasion. And, uh, Breast cancer, you know that there are two uh, main groups of uh, breast cancer. And if you talking about uh, localization, one is ductal carcinoma, one is lobular carcinoma. And it can be either 
in situ when uh, the tumor does not escape the duct itself or invasive or in between will be uh, microinvasive. Uh, and then how do cell migrate? Well, they might migrate as a completely isolated cell or as a bulk of cells breaching out uh, all of the membrane uh, or uh, as, a, as a trail, I mean, one by one, like little Indians, one will find a way uh, through the extracellular matrix and the other will follow one by one. And what we did is to recapitulate uh, this functioning uh, in comparison with uh, some work which was done by uh, one of our collaborators, Philippe Chavrier at Curie. Uh, he grew uh, some uh, specific uh, ductal carcinoma in situ in a uh, cell line in, uh, in some matrix cell in 3D uh, suspension. And uh, for uh, <coughs> the wild type for which MMP is, uh, is off, uh, well, there is no, uh, I mean, breaching of uh, the matricial mimicking the extracellular membrane. Uh, where, uh, and uh, the simulation we did on the right uh, show the same behavior. You can have some sporadic migration, but altogether it remains on this unstable. Whereas if you take another mutant cell line now, for which uh, the, these uh, metalloproteinase are uh, strongly activated, then you see uh, like a solar storm, meaning many uh, cells escaping uh, the spheroid uh, tumors and reaching out uh, the matricial. And quite similarly, we, we found the same behavior uh, using uh, this uh, Physibus simulation. So this composite uh, modeling uh, can be seen as a computational parallel organoid. Uh, and uh, it shed light on uh, what happens in disease, but also it can be a way to uh, figure out what perturbation might, uh, might, uh, might produce. And it can be used to orient uh, experiment design. Uh, but now we, what we want to do is to extend it to uh, these complex simulations uh, with more uh, different types of cells and uh, which better description of the internal network model. And this requires heavy computation. And this is uh, what is going on for, for one year now in the context of uh, the Permetco uh, Center of Excellence project uh, that you know, I guess, and uh, which is coordinating with, uh, with Alfonso. And in which are now is a play the, among others, play the a key role. Okay, uh, so the acknowledgement for this part uh, for Indiana University from BSC Arnau, Miguel, Gerard, and Fonso. And in the group, it's, uh, I must underline Marco and Vincent, uh, who are key, and Laurence, who are key, uh, key players. Okay, so I'm done. So I'll be happy to to take questions. I hope I've not been too, too long. Yes, no, no, just in time, in fact. So thank you, thank you very much for, for this nice presentation. So I don't know if there are questions in the room, please raise your hand or write your questions in the chat. I see already a question by Winona. Uh, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it to Winona? Hi, I, I think there's a confusion because I'm Winona and I, I didn't write this question. I think someone entered the, the call with my link. <laughs> if you want, I can read it, but I didn't write it. I have another one. <laughs> Ruben Chazarra. Okay, so Ruben, can you, can you ask what you wrote? Maybe you don't have a mic. Hi. Yes. I, I'm not sure you hear me. So I was interested in the in the LP graph method um, you you presented, um, and I was wondering how does it deal with with disconnected topologies, because it's well in, in my experience it's happened sometimes that that when you have the dimensionality reduction of the of the single cell data set, despite you know that there is, you know from the biology that there is a, a differentiation trajectory, the fact that you have the groups of cells separated and not forming a continuum um, makes the method to generate different graphs and hence to, to generate different trajectories. But what you really want is to have one. So I was wondering how does the method uh, deal with, with this disconnected topologies, which are quite uh, frequent? Okay, well, well, good, uh, good question, thank you. Well, indeed, uh, uh, in this present implementation, we deal with connected uh, graphs. Uh, 
but then uh, for, which means that you have to uh, uh, split it into connected components before running uh, uh, the analysis. But you know, can you see my screen or? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, uh, but you know, nothing prevents you in the implementation of the algorithm to allow for having a disconnected uh, topology and to have uh, uh, then uh, optimization on uh, on, on this uh, I mean, uh, reunion of of two uh, of two or more disconnected uh, subcomponents, but it's not implemented. It's, it's a question of grammar. If in your grammar you allow for disconnecting, you, you will uh, you will be able to uh, to recapitulate uh, disconnected uh, components. Okay, thank you. But I don't have the practical solution for today, except I mean. Disconnected your component uh, before running uh, the tool. Yes. Now that that we're with LP Graph, I had a small question about this. Uh, did you? So in order to do the the, the reduced dimensionality uh, space, uh, in in the case of single cell RNA, you use I guess this this kind of single cell RNA. But could you use multiomics as well? Like I mean something similar to what you presented on the on the heart um, heart patients, the heart disease patients. Would you be able to integrate uh, um, a tax seek or something like that with with LP graph in order to have such such analysis as well using this multiomics? Uh, so with LP graph you can analyze, I mean, transcriptome or metilome or any epigenome data independently. That's the first thing. But now Jonathan back, which I mentioned before, is uh, as a collaboration between uh, Andre Vinovia from Luca Pinello and Harvard, is developing a multiomics approach. Okay. And uh, this is based on optimal transfer, optimal transport, which enables you to map the two distribution. I mean, the, say, attack stack distribution and uh, transcriptome distribution. And then you can do uh, your optimization onto uh, the, the merged uh, representation. Okay. Okay, great. So, so it will, I guess it will be, it should be out within a, I don't know, I don't want to talk for Jonathan, but within a, a few months for, for sure. <laughs> Okay, ne next week. Tell him next week. So, <laughs> uh, we have some, some raised hands. Uh, Winona, uh, now I guess it's true, true, Winona. Please go ahead. Yes, now it's true. <laughs> uh, hi, thanks for this very interesting uh, talk. I just had a small question. I'm interested in the part of uh, merging these different omics data on the bulk sequencing. And I, I it, it was not clear to me which was the method to obtain this consensus network. Uh, merging the three omics that they use on the on the bulk analysis, and we what is, what is the minimum number of samples needed for this method to be able to infer biologically meaningful clusters? You are referring to this similarity similarity network fusion. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, here. Uh, well, as to the minimum, it's always the same story. You know, it's a. Uh, the more the best. <laughs> uh, so I don't have an answer for them. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. It depends on the size of your network. It depends probably of many factors, and there might not be a general answer to this question. But the question is was also how does it work, if my understanding is correct. Uh, yes. Is this a method that it's publi published by you in a paper, or how does, yeah, is this a part? The, the, the main idea is that uh, with each level of omics, you can design a proximity graph in between tumors. So we have, we have three different levels. We have three different proximity graphs. All of them have the same nodes. Each node is a patient, and they are linked together because they have similar transcriptome here, a metilome here, a proteome here, OK? But then once you have this type of network, one typical thing you want to do is to figure out which one are the solid edges, which one are not solid edges. And for doing so, uh, of course, there is a strength of connection, but there is also the strength that you might have the same edge elsewhere, or you might have also indirect connection, which strengthens your confidence in the connection between your two, uh, your two, uh, your two nodes. And the way it's done in, uh, in this uh, similarity network fusion is that you strengthen uh, the, the face you have in one edge and at one level using the, the other indirect you might have at another level, or the other direction you might have at another level. So it makes evolve uh, each network in the, um, on, its, on its own, 
but using the information from the other networks. And at the end, it should converge toward some consensus uh, network. And this is somehow a latent representation of what's going on in the three different levels. That's why it can be considered as a intermediary uh, integration approach, not, not an early one, not a late one, but rather intermediary. And there is a paper, is it the paper, the, the reference is here. The yeah. Nature Methods 2014, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, there is another question from Miguel Ponce de Leon. Miguel, we cannot hear you if you're talking. Yes, he's tinkering. Okay, so yeah, my, while we wait for, for Miguel, uh, I can have a curiosity question more than more than a scientific question. So this this uh, work with with the with the heart disease patients that was between ninety two and ninety five, that you said that it was difficult to reproduce with with other patients because of of uh, GDPR and, 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 and stuff. Uh, was there, I mean, is that the reason why you didn't extend it beyond 95 uh, for, for this clean trash and analysis? Yes, no, I mean, we, I mean, we did not collect this information ourselves. Uh, it turned out that in Krasnoyak, they had collected the data set. And uh, since uh, Andre is in obvious, I mean, uh, the, the copy I of the team, uh, did his PhD in Krasnoyark, he has good links with uh, with them and my, my, was able to uh, to have access to this data set. But if you look at uh, which clinical, I mean, full clinical data that is available in the public domain, uh, we only found two. One is about uh, diabetes uh, in uh, the early uh, 2000, and, and one is this Krasnoyark uh, okay. Uh, that's it. So it's, it's quite difficult to have access to clinical data. And, uh, yeah, well, you yeah. can understand. I mean, you don't want uh, privacy to be uh, to be breached, but also you want to be able to to progress in science and in uh, in medicine. So and for that, you need data. Yes, because the idea is that even without uh, naming the the patient, you should you could be able to trace who the person is with that with that matrix, right? Yeah. Yeah, now it's, there is a whole field about uh, anonymization and de-anonymization of, uh, of data and many people play with, uh, with this idea and have shown that even if you don't have any name with the date of visit and uh, the year of birth and uh, which hospital it has been to, uh, you can uh, locate quite, uh, sometimes quite not easily, but with, I mean, with success, uh, who, who was uh, behind uh, yes. a given record. Okay, mm. Miguel, can do you I, want to Can you hear me now? Yes, now yes, yeah. go ahead. Okay, I, I get that. Uh... Uh, it comes and goes. Hello, Manuel, thank you for the presentation, really interesting. Uh, so much results that uh, I, I need to focus on some particular question. I would like to go back to the multi-layer approach you use. And I was wondering, uh, it's really interesting that when you fusion the different networks, uh, you can clearly uh, describe the different group. And I was wondering if you, uh, you know, can extract the information, you know, the relation between the different networks uh, that help you discriminate the different subgroup of patients. So, do you know, it's, I know it's a very open question, but can you extract the information from the relation between the different layers? I mean, to, to extract that information. Uh, okay, it works as a black box. You create this multi-layer, you run your clustering algorithm and you are able to yeah. recover this. But can you explain the features that you extract from the multi-layer that helps you to separate the groups? More or less something like that. Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, indeed, I mean, you, you want to produce something meaningful, but you'd like to uh, to be able to explain how you get it and, and why you get it and what are the important uh, uh, features which uh, lead to this uh, situation. Uh, in, and uh, that's one, uh, if I take this slide again, you know, that, that's one thing you can, uh, you can achieve when, uh, in general, when, uh, when you do uh, intermediate uh, data integration, uh, you build a latent space 
and uh, you can you by, by, by the function which maps each of the omics to this space and space uh, I mean, in general, if, depending on the nature of this equation, you might have access or not uh, to uh, what is the important features in a, in the in a, in this mapping. Uh, so, in the case of uh, similarity network fusion, uh, I suppose it should be possible to retrieve. Uh, I mean, at least you can map the former network to the new networks and uh, and figure out which one is reinforced. Uh, I don't have a practical immediate solution, but I, I guess you can, I mean, solve at least partially this question of finding which one were, uh, were essential and which one uh, were not. Uh, a simple answer is to say that, uh, well, okay, but the links that you have kept between this situation and this one uh, are those uh, for which uh, uh, you have high confidence. And if you look, uh, for each of these links, if they are built, for example, by a simple correlation, which ones contribute the most to the correlation, you will have uh, your answer. So. Okay, 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 I see. Thank you. So uh, you take the ratio of uh, these links over uh, here, over the links here, um, and you figure out which one is improved, which one is not. I mean, intuitively, that's uh, what I will do. Yeah. Okay. This one, yeah. this one has fainted, so probably uh, the basis basis which is, I mean, this patient could contributing to these links is probably not uh, relevant and so on. So it requires some uh, handiwork, but uh, you, you, can, uh, you can get information out of that, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, I think we're five minutes over, over the clock. I think it was a very, very nice uh, seminar and very nice questions, very nice discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you, Manuel, again for for coming coming virtually to our place, and and to have this. Uh, I think uh, there are more discussions in in the in the afternoon with uh, with some 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 people. Uh, but in any case, thank you, thank you all for coming, and and let's um, let's meet each other in a couple of weeks, I think. And and please don't steal links from other people, else we have clones, and we don't like that. So yeah, see you, see you soon, and and thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thanks. Bye-bye.